Hey everyone, Jake and Paul here with a quick and friendly request to rate and review Lawsome wherever you find your podcasts. Ratings and reviews are like food for the show, and we all know how important food is. Real important. So if you like Lawsome, please show your support and keep it fed. Thanks. If you've watched any amount of cartoons over your lifespan, you may remember the 1949 Tex Avery cartoon, The House of Tomorrow. In it, we learn about a futuristic place where all of our luxuries are more luxurious and the strains of everyday life are made less strenuous, all thanks to technology. So it is today. Tech fixes are everywhere, and no, there aren't any radish burping machines. Keyless entry, remote video of the house, the nursery, the dogs, endless streams of content on our phones, Amazon Next Day, chatbots, text templates, single sandwich delivery... All of these tech trends have a replacement angle. We used to have to use our hands to open doors. There was a time where we had to trust our neighbors and those who watched our kids. To learn about the world, we had to buy a local newspaper. We had to go to the store. We had to talk to customer service people, actual people. And if we wanted a sandwich, we had to get off our butts and go get it. In our never-ending quest for ease and comfort, there's something about tech replacements that should give us pause. Are we changing fundamental aspects of what it means to be an autonomous human? Then, of course, there are positives. At the law firm, you may work hard answering the same questions day in and day out, and the result will be you never get to your work. Chatbots are quickly becoming a part of the law firm of tomorrow, a place where tech can replace the doldrum work and allow lawyers the freedom to focus on their calling rather than focusing on all those calls. That's what we're talking about today. Legal chatbots and the law firm of tomorrow. Let's go. Lawson, the podcast for law firms. Powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that claps when the plane lands. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional development. I'm Jake Sanders, your co-host, and joining me is our co-co-host, the Willy Wonka of website design, Paul Julius. What's sweet in your world, Polly? Everything. Everything's sweet in my world. <laughs> well, it's called diabetes. <laughs> yeah. I hope I hope you're kind of like you mixing some Splenda in there. <laughs> I got to cut back, dude. Yeah, you really do. Uh, <laughs> what's what's on the show today? Today, we dig into an article about chatbots from the Fordham Law Journal. We interview lawyer, speaker, legal tech evangelist Patrick Pallas about Patbot, his very own legal chatbot. And then we place Pat under the lights for five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The link today is from Fordham Law Journal. It's called Legal Chatbots, Advancing Technology and Lawyers of the Future by Ariel Darvish. Uh, We'll give you the synopsis here. Over the last couple of years, chatbots have become increasingly popular in the context of legal services. Chatbots are a form of technology that allow for people to interact with software in the form of a conversation without requiring that user to have technological expertise. In the legal context, chatbots can, among other things, assist in obtaining legal information, filling out filing forms, and performing client intake. The questions that this and other technological advancements raise are whether and how access to legal information and services through such platforms will affect the need for human lawyers in the future. That's the brief synopsis. What was your hot take there on this one, Paul? I think people are concerned that that tech that you know the rise of the bots. That, that technology right. is taken over and that it's going to dehumanize to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. I like what this article says that, that really you're looking at what are things that maybe people don't need to do. What's repetitive? What's something that can be streamlined? Mm-hmm. And, you know, answering simple questions for anybody who's at a, you know, busy, busy law firm or, you know, has your phones ringing constantly – you get asked, and, and like Patrick says, you get mm-hmm. asked a lot of the same things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's kind of my hot take from this is there's uh, there's some pretty good ways here to maybe handle some of that repetitive um, questions and, and processes. Right. And, and give people back 
uh, the time that they can bill appropriately. One of the things we discover later on in the interview um, is that in an eight hour day, lawyers are really only spending two hours doing that advisory work. Um, mm. During the during the research for this, I came across a couple other articles. Um, one was about uh, the do not pay bot, which is created by Joshua Browder. He created this bot that helps people fight parking tickets. But it, it kind of just takes this this nonsensical work that somebody could be dedicating their <laughs> their legal day to, and it offloads that. You know, it so so if if this is one of those repetitive moments where you can outsource it, um, I think chatbots are a good way to approach that. And I do see that once natural language processing and those kind of uh, those things start taking off, we're still in the very early stages of that. I could see this going more in depth. I could see this going more into the advisory work. So I kind of see where that fear comes from. But for right now, for 2018, if you're answering the same questions over and over and over, f there's an option for you to just not to, to cut that out. You know, your paralegals are answering the same question. Your receptionist is answering the same question over and over and over. Figure that out. This is a good way to do that. And you can, you know, get your time back. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So definitely. I think what's a lawyer to do? You want to create your own chat bot? or not. Uh, our interview with Patrick Pallas will help answer some of these questions. And we discover that it's, it's not simple, but once you do it, it can be pretty powerful. So let's head to the interview. And now a word from our sponsor. I met Tanner, who works for Consult Webs, on a plane on the way back from Key West, Florida. And I'd just been thinking that I needed to do some more marketing for my law firm. So when he told me that he worked for Consult Webs, I was super excited. From the beginning till even now, I've been with them for almost two years. And the experience has really been great. Having Consult Webs on board is really like having your own team of people that really care about what kind of business you're getting. I mean, practicing law can seem kind of lonely. You always are wondering, how am I going to get clients? How am I going to make payroll? But with Consult Webs, it's not just me worrying about having people come in the door. They're there as well. And they've been so responsive. Since I started with Consult Webs, I have increased the number of employees, double at least. And since I started with Consult Webs, the revenue has tripled. So it's really been an incredible experience. Go to consultwebs.com to learn more. And now for a lawsome interview. Patrick Pallas is the owner of Pallas Law a personal injury and workers' compensation firm in Tacoma, Washington. In 2016, the Law 500 recognized Palace Law as one of the top law firms nationwide for its growth and innovation. Patrick has been president of the Washington State Bar and currently serves on the National Council for Bar President's Executive Council. Whether on webinars, podcasts, radio shows, keynote presentations, or his own TV show, Patrick is an outspoken practitioner of law, and he's traveled the world spreading the legal gospel. His most recent project is a legal tech summit for lawyers. He also owns his own winery, Sunken Cellars, and preaches and teaches mindfulness and yoga. After a huge year and a full schedule, Patrick has made some time for us to talk about innovation, pat bots, and more on the Lawson Podcast. Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you for those kind, kind words. Well, if they weren't real then, you know, we'll have to talk about it later. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's talk about your career path from simple cave lawyer to your speaking work, advocating on behalf of legal tech and innovation in law firms. Yeah. So this would be the medical process where I had uh, my knuckles shaved, my arm shortened. Is that the process? <laughs> I didn't want to get too into the, the anti-Neanderthal surgeries because that, right. that can be really hard. It's a Cro-Magnon kind of medicine. I had my, my brow lifted and I'm feeling much brighter now. Thank you. <laughs> I actually understood your questions. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, your your words scare me. Um, <laughs> yeah, love right. that. Yeah. So no. Yeah. So where where'd you come from? I mean, most lawyers don't go around um, doing conferences and do the speaking thing. What what kind of drove you towards that legal tech innovation and kind of a 
speaking engagements? You know, it really came from 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 two places. Originally, you know, being a small practitioner in Tacoma, Washington, doing workers' compensation work, I got tired of answering the phone for potential clients every day and giving the same advice over and over and over again, like dozens of times a day, a week, hundreds of times a month. And I said, you know what? There's got to be a better way to do this. What if I created a television show? And in my television show, I talked about people's rights and talked about people's remedies, and I brought on a guest or two, and then we aired the TV show across the state. And I started out, of course, talking about workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I can just give all of the key advice once, maybe if I give it out to a half a million people, we'll we'll make some progress. And the show ended up uh, going through a number of of seasons. Uh, I did one show for the Washington State Bar Association. And then I did another show for the Washington State Association of Justice. And that really got me into doing media and, and speaking and being more comfortable in front of a camera or, or a mic. And from there, uh, I started taking higher and higher leadership roles through the bar and through the ABA mm-hmm. uh, and eventually ended up being president of the bar where uh, I focused on the future of the profession. But I got to tell you, when you spend half your time running your law firm, and then the other half of the time doing volunteer work for the bar, there's really not much room for innovation. I spent seven years volunteering and preaching what people needed to do and hearing about what's being done and talking to solo and small practitioners across the country. But then I wasn't able to do it in my own office because there was no day left. So as soon as I came off being president, Uh, I sat down with the firm and said, we are going to dig deep and we're going to go fast. And we tore apart virtually every structure in our office and reinvented the office as if we had never had one before. And uh, so that was a change in people and structure and in workflow and in media and marketing. Uh, Everything got torn up. And so that has been my trajectory because as we found more success in our firm, I've spent more time on the road telling other bars and doing podcasts like this, um, tools that we're learning, tools that help lawyers be more efficient, tools that grow the practice into the future. And it's led to a lot of cool opportunities. Let's jump right into one of those opportunities. It's PatBot, your legal chat bot. So, <laughs> it, yep. I, I mean, you kind of gave the genesis where that idea came from, but was the pat bot, you know, selling your firm on it? Was was it a staffing concern, or was it a marketing play, or how how did that kind of the generation of that, and then the installation? Yeah, it really is access to justice is is the main purpose there, mm. right? Like we can't talk to enough injured workers in the state of Washington. Our phone is ringing all day, and I'm very happy about that. I mean, it's a law firm; that's great to have it. But the reality is that we can't talk to everybody. And a lot of people are scared of lawyers and scared we charge fees if they get us on the phone. And a lot of people simply don't have a key to the courthouse or any access to understand their rights and remedies. So consistent with the purpose of the television show and and a lot of the work that we've done here in the office, we said what we need is uh, a method for people to communicate online 24-7 that will do a complete analysis of their case tell them what the issues are so they understand what's important and what's not, and then give them a a template to do it themselves. So what the chatbot does is you you come onto the website, it's on our homepage, and uh, you fill out uh, a dozen questions, mostly yes or no, very simple to do, happens very quickly, and it will identify all the issues in your workers' compensation case that are critical to your case and explains the law around each issue. Then if any of uh, the people who come to the, to the PatBot want to take action, really DIY it themselves, they push a take action button and then they get access to forms and to pleadings. They get access to resources and links and it allows them to do the case all on their own. If at any time they want to call me or talk to my staff, they're welcome to do that. But the, but the process, the PatBot was really created just to give people uh, access. The other cool byproduct of this is Mm -hmm. that it gives us a lot of data, right? So we have written beneath the PatBot a collection of all the answers to all the questions. That helps us identify what are the critical issues that people are facing? What's the most common issue? Where are people struggling the most? 
that helps us simply build up the pat bot as we continue to go through new versions, new iterations to really beef up where people need us the most and maybe not do as much on issues that we thought were important, but really aren't apparently as important to the people out there who are in trouble. Man, and it's really it's it's a tool to question your assumptions because we 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 often come on board with a lot of assumptions about what our clients are experiencing and what they need, but we can't escape ourselves. So this is a great way to just have your client tell you, you know, oh, they're really asking about this. Let's focus on that. Oh, it's so genius. What a great There's so, another cool couple of cool pieces to it if I can just add on if you don't go mind. Go ahead, man, please. Um, yeah, one of them is we put a feedback loop in it, right? So at the end of each use of the pat bot they get to tell us what they think did it work did it not work what was done well what wasn't done well you know tell us and so we collect answers all day every day 24 7 on how to improve it and we immediately get really good feedback and we continue to put it right back and do it my partner who's doing this is law droid uh tom martin from vancouver who is an amazing uh amazing man who's been making pat bots fact he's making one for uh, the Tennessee bar. He's working in one for the Washington bar. There's people out there um, that he's building pat bots for, chat bots for. He's really a great innovator, and I have to put a plug out for him. But the other piece that's um, that's fun about this is that if one of our people who uses the pat bot decides they want to call us, then we have that information right there in front of us. We already know a lot about their case. So when we start talking to them and say, "Hi, I'm Steve," like, "Hello, Steve. I I saw what's going on in your case." Let's jump into this and get some answers and let's get some resolution, right? Because we know uh, some of the data and some of the problems they already have. So it shortcuts the conversation. We can get right into helping them. Genius. And so as you were creating that uh, with LawDroid, what was the workload like as you were creating the chat bot? Was it what you expected? Was it more or less just kind of the experience <laughs> of kind of, <laughs> yeah. uh oh, here we go. I, I will tell you the tech side of it was a piece of cake for me because I left that all to Tom Martin, who is the Czech genius. Right? Nice. Uh, that was really easy for me. The hard part was that I had to think of a way to synthesize 350 statutes, uh, 100 years of case law. And all of the policies used by employers and the Department of Labor Industries down to like 12 questions. Um, and I'll tell you, I've been practicing for, for 25 years, and I, 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 I used every last one of those years in being able to put that together. It was a lot of thinking. I found myself every time I was flying somewhere and sitting on an airplane for six hours, just a lot of navel gazing, just thinking, how do I synthesize this? And so I wrote out uh, a map for the questions. And then I spent the next probably month shrinking it and shrinking it and shrinking it and shrinking it down to really core, core issues. That old saying about, uh, you know, if I'd had more time, I would have made this shorter. I yep. took the time and got the entire area of law down to about 12 questions. That was the work. That was the work. Putting it into a pat bot was a matter of handing it over to some genius like Tom Martin and he uh, transformed it. Nice. So I have I have a question here about ethics, and and I think you're in a unique position with this because of your obviously your work with the bar. But I think one thing that prevents some other lawyers and law firms from getting involved in this is they're concerned about privacy. If someone divulges sensitive info to the bot, like are you concerned? Does that have they formed some kind of relationship with the firm now? Could you talk about that a little bit? You know, I, I will tell you this, and and I, I'll tell you who's really help me see this view better and better is Mark Britton and Josh King from Avo. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I started like a lot of lawyers being very, very cautious about the rules of ethics and not wanting to breach any of them and, you know, answering everything down to the nth and then always saying, uh, but I'm not representing you. We don't have a relationship. I really have I've dumped so much of that and just stopped worrying my job is to be pragmatic. My job is to get information to the people who need it. And you know what? If I don't follow the rules perfectly, then I don't follow the rules perfectly. You know, when you're writing answers for AVO, uh, there's not enough place in there to answer every question that, that somebody may have to the nth degree and then write a two paragraph disclaimer, right? <laughs> right. In, mm. in, in this modern day of law, right, with this huge access to justice gap, People don't want a treatise and they don't really care about the, the clauses saying we're not a, we don't have a relationship and, and, and this isn't advice and yada, yada, yada. I mean, yes, it's probably a good practical idea to, to do it, 
But I just had to step away from that. My job, my job is to give people advice. My job is to give people information. My job is to help people get into a better place any way that I can do it. And I stay focused on that. And um, the pat bots the, the same way. It, it really is just a way to get information to people. And if I had got all wrapped up in, 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 the, in the finer points of, of the ethics, I think I probably would have scared myself away from it. And, you know, and that's interesting because um, you talk about getting people the stuff they want. Most people just want an answer. Yes. I, I, I just want to know, you know, I just, and, and we were, when we were doing research for this, we found that a lot of people would prefer to chat with a bot, like whether it was, you know, with the cable company or whatever, because I just want what I need to know as fast as I can get it. So in that line, have you had feedback about PatBot? You know, you like know what kind of? I told you we had a feedback loop. So we have been collecting feedback from from people. So far, no one has written me a lot. You know, I'll read you a couple of the things that people have given us. Like everything was perfect. I mean, that's great. Somebody else says really great. Uh, someone right. else says it's uh, it's just more information to make sure you're doing the right thing. Somebody else says. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Right. So at the moment, those are the kind of comments that we're collecting. I suspect as we start to build a bigger sample and we get in the thousands of people using it, we'll, we'll continue to get more comments. that will help us really drill down to be more and more efficient and really give people what they need. But you've never, you haven't had anything like negative though. So that's positive. No, right? absolutely. You know? Absolutely nothing negative. We even had some trolls out there trying to break it, which by the way, I am great with anybody out there hearing this podcast you want to come to palacelaw.com, you want to come bust my pat bot, do your best, bring it on. Because if you can, it means I need something to, I, I need to fix it. And we've had lots of friends out there busting it. My 17 year old boy busted it for a month, like every hour <laughs> just for kicks. You know, one of the best things he did, we thought we had everything solved. And in one of the answers, he writes in, I love you. And the thing <laughs> crashes. Like, who writes it? I love you into a pat pot. <laughs> well, I have a I have a question about um just kind of the firm. Have you since you put in pat but pat <laughs> since you put in pat bot the, the pat bot or the pat the bot? Pat bot. Way. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> since you put since you put in the chat bot, have you seen signs like the signups for work comp cases go up uh, with pat bot? I mean, the answer is yes, but the, but the sample is relatively small so far. Mm -hmm. What I suspect will happen will be two things. One is that we're going to have a more educated and knowledgeable phone call when someone does talk to us because they will have already like, bitted the case, known their issues, know what they have to do. So I look forward to a shorter phone call with people who know exactly what they want. The other thing that I suspect uh, will happen is that people will know more what it is they want, right, as they get more data and more information. Um, it's harder, I think, when you're calling around to law firms and you're leaving your me message and hoping someone will call you back or trying to run around uh, and learn stuff from uh, various websites. If you have a one-stop shop that identifies all your issues and lays them out, I, I think it really helps people get what they need. So you, so you recently spoke at Lawyernomics. Um, you're talking right. about Mark, uh, Mark Britton, who I love, and he's moving right. on from Avo. Um, so – what was the feel of lawyers there? What are lawyers kind of concerned about these days? Did you see a kind of through line when you were talking to folks, when they approached you? Is there, what's kind of the buzzwords that people are getting? I'll tell you what I love about Lawyernomics is that it really is a group of lawyers who are so motivated to push the profession forward. They're all looking for ways to be more efficient, to provide better service. Um, uh, to make sure they're taking better care of their clients. Uh, they're interested in growth and technology. Uh, and and ClioCon, going to the, the uh, Clio Cloud Conference, it's the same way, same kind of groups of people. Mm -hmm. Lawyernomics tends to focus a little more on, on marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, at this conference, uh, Jack Newton, who's the CEO of Clio, and I spoke about data analytics, and in particular, uh, data-driven law. And I've been calling it Moneyball Law because it, yep. it's like the movie Moneyball where you're looking at analytics, how to make a baseball team using statistics to determine who you hire and what to pay for them. We're using a lot of analytics in our firm. Um, and so Jack Newton has a really great presentation about his legal trends report uh, for 2016, 2017 that gives an overview of the entire profession and where we are and what's happening. And this is maybe one of those uh, – uh, uh, spoiler alerts. Mm -hmm. uh, but the end of his presentation, he tells you, guess what, guys? We're all losing six hours a day. 
we're losing six hours out of our workday that is not billable or productive uh, or that we're getting money from. And so my side of the presentation is drilling down into a single law firm and saying, how do you recover those six hours? What are your analytics? How do you look at your KPIs? How can you use data to drive your practice to success? And so that's kind of the one-two uh, punch that we that we delivered. And Lawyernomics was the perfect place to do that because everyone is very hungry for sharing information, saying what they're doing well, getting new ideas, and bringing it home. So, so when you're talking about kind of making that – so there's two types of uh, work that's happening in a law firm, process work and advisory work. So you got your process stuff, which is running your business and your advisory work, which is what you went to school for, which is what they pay the big bucks for. Um, are you seeing that there's any realistic legal tech advice for lawyers out there that can help them? I mean, that you're seeing uh, there's so many ways to get started, so many advice columns and how to's, so many law firms just end up not doing anything. They have kind of this analysis paralysis. Um, how, how do you reframe the overwhelming nature of tech as sort of a point of inspiration? Wow, oh, that's actually, I think it's really easy. Um, we are in a time of unparalleled opportunity, mm. right? Everything is shifting around us. It's pretty clear that your grandfather's or grandmother's law office operations no longer apply today. Mm. Um, we find a number of things like wages nationally for lawyers are staying exactly the same as they were 10 years ago. We're not growing as a profession. And people are very hungry uh, to provide better service and to grow opportunity and to expand their offices. And when they find a law firm that is succeeding, when they find tools, that work and help them grow, they jump all over. This idea about lawyers being late adopters, I don't think of so much about a mindset as it is about opportunity. You show someone how to grow their firm. You give them tools to do that. You give them a roadmap and everyone's going to follow. And I, coming to conferences like CleoCon or Lawyernomics, uh, we were at Salt Lake City uh, Innovations Conference last week. Uh, I'm speaking in, in Tennessee at Tennessee Bar Conference next week. You get in front of these groups and you start giving them tools. I mean, people get excited. There's tons of questions. Um, I, I think what we really need in this profession uh, is better tools, more opportunities. Everyone's looking for things. There's a lot of great providers. There's a lot of great tools. Uh, they're, they're not standardized yet. They don't fit together yet. Uh, they're not for everybody yet. And so I think it takes time putting down your pleadings, stepping away from the court, and going inward and working on your operations, really finding ways to improve your firm, reading articles, listening to podcasts like you guys, right? And picking up ideas and seeing where trends are. And by doing that, I think we really start looking at the operations and taking advantage of the huge opportunities that are out there. Because this economy, man, this economy is shifting right around us. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless lawyers jump on that opportunity, uh, they're going to be missing out on, on one of the coolest tracks that law has ever been on. Yeah, without a doubt. And so I, I think there is those, there, there are, is an overwhelming abundance of treasure maps and how to's and, and uh, case studies. And these guys did this and wow. And, and I've been to those conferences, you know, and I've, I've been inspired. I've had the Kindle in my heart, like just explode with flames. I love it. And then I go back to the law firm and it's nothing happens. Because no one wants to do it because they don't know where to start. I've seen these lawyers get the, the giant eyeballs and they're like, oh my God, this could revolutionize what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paperless billing, you know, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We can do, you know, optical character recognition on PDFs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. and they're like, oh, oh. And then they go back and then two weeks later, their hair's on fire and they're asleep under their desk because they, they don't have the ability to focus. I mean, like coming from maybe some of that mindfulness, do because you you said inward and navel gazing, and a lot of people think that right. those are negative things, but I really do believe that to figure out the next steps, you got to really understand where you've come from. So, I, I mean, is there something? Have you seen someone who's like Patrick? Man, I have all the inspiration in the world, and I just can't get it going on. Like, 
what are your kind of advice for those lawyers who are inspired and they want to do something, but they just keep coming back and hitting their heads against the same brick wall? So let me take a step back a minute and approach this from maybe a 10,000 foot view. Yeah. The, the problem with our profession is we have these rules of ethics that we think silo us in a protected place where no one can invade our practice. Because if they do, God damn it, that's unauthorized practice of law and we're going to stamp them out. Right. Uh, but I will tell you, that is a completely backwards approach. The reality is that our rules of ethics uh, that are that surround us and the silo of this monopoly we have is really a pair of absolute rock solid handcuffs that stop us from being able to do the things we need to do. And I'll give you an example. If 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 we considered lawyers like pilots, right? Mm -hmm. Pilots fly planes. So let's just give pilots all the license and and the silo for everything planes. Uh, where do you think the industry would go, right? Well, they'd fly the planes, but would we have a Boeing? Would we have an airplane industry? How about airports? Would pilots create the airports? How about the travel industry? Would pilots create the travel industry? Right. Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. It's because pilots were never siloed so that they had control of an entire industry. And thank God, because look at what an amazing industry the whole travel process has turned into. Mm -hmm. Attorneys don't have any tools to build airports or planes, right? They're, they're really siloed into we practice law. What about in investment or marketing or operations management, right? You, the list can go on and on and on. Lawyers are without those tools. So when I hear you say things like, oh, somebody's so motivated to do it, but they don't know where to start, it's because we're lawyers. Hello, we're lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> what we need is the opportunity to partner with all of the people that have all of the keys to grow our practices. And so one of the things I talk about in our summit that we're taking around the country and talking about is wiping out some of these archaic rules. We need to bring in partners in other areas. We need to bring in tech partners. We need to bring in venture capital. We need to be able to bring in people who really understand how to grow our practices. The only way we're going to take this access to justice gap and shrink it is when we bring in a whole lot of other players who are really specialists that we can partner with to grow it like pilots did with Boeing and airports and everything else, right? Mm. So we don't have that yet, but I'm a, you're talking about, you know, uh, legal gospel. Um, that's <laughs> what I've been preaching, that it's time for us to change this paradigm, to reframe our rules, to open up doors, to get investment and opportunity and to bring in partners and to really make law realize its potential because we are we're losing our potential keeping ourselves inside of this handcuffed silo at the moment the tools we have are things like this in my firm the last four hires that i have made have been non-legal i don't i know i'm done hiring lawyers and paralegals uh they are so entrenched in law and think like lawyers and think with legal process i want other people we brought in somebody who's a who's a user experience designer. We brought in somebody who's a project manager. We brought in somebody who's a communications director, right? Nice. People who are outside of our profession. I don't want them to know anything about lawyers. The less they know, the better off I am because they bring in that diversity and that fresh knowledge and they look at things differently and they have a different lens, right? And then we can start to build a practice. My project manager takes projects. I mean, we're doing a project a week, sometimes doing multiple projects a week and every project that she's ahead of she puts together teams in the firm or teams outside of the firm with tech companies. And, and, and like we, we've had partnerships with now seven different tech companies building tools that we need for our office. And the good news is those tools are good for firms across the country. We help a tech company design a tool. We get a tool really inexpensively because we're the beta testers and, and part half of the process behind building it. And then the tech company gets to go sell it across the country and say what a great product it is, right? And we've done this over and over and over again, uh, and it's very fun. So what do I have to say to that sole practitioner who goes to a conference that's inspired but comes back home and says, I don't know where to start? My answer is reach out, find a partner, a tech partner, a project manager, a coder, somebody. Reach out, bring them into your firm part-time, bring them in full-time, contract with them, a subcontractor. Let them use their expertise to build the, the, the holes that you have in your practice and build it out. Because you know what? 
We're not experts. We're pilots. <laughs> well, it just it just it just reflects so profoundly on our whole culture because no one wants to say they don't know. We all have an answer for everything. And, you know, I think it's it's what's what in a brilliant answer that it's actually it's not up to you solely. It's up to you and your expanding network and, and kind of making the most of what you have. Oh, gosh, yeah, Pat. Um, OK, well, unfortunately, hey, what, go ahead. High five. I feel like we just high fived in there. No, I just I just <laughs> I, but I just feel it because but you're actually doing what everybody says. And I like that your story started from. I kept on saying it, but I didn't have time to do it. You know, the cobbler's kids have no shoes. Right. You know, it's like, I, I know how to do it, but I'm just not doing it for myself. So wrapping up real fast, yeah. uh, and then we'll head on to the five questions. How can people learn more about you, Patrick? Well, I guess they can go to the website. Um, I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me at Palace Law. Uh, if you want to talk, share ideas, uh, be a partner, um, you, you can find me on my email at patrick at palacelaw.com um, or just hang out at conferences. I find myself speaking at more and more conferences. I'm home about five days in June. Otherwise, it's running from conference to conference, which I love to do because that brings back information for me. I get to share information with others. You get continue to stir that pod of innovation out there. So I'm out there, but I'm happy to chat with anybody anytime and hear what you're doing and, and share what I'm doing. Five questions that used to be 10 questions we ask everyone. Number one, what was the last book you read? Um, thank you for being late. All right. Number two, what is your favorite place? Oh, gosh. That's a hard one. Uh, I'm a big, big fisherman. I try to fish as many days in my life as I can. So Astoria, Washington, a little fishing town on the... Uh, um, on the intersection of the Pacific Ocean and Columbia River, probably. Hell yeah. That yeah site nice. of the Goonies. Isn't that where hey, Goonies? That is. That's exactly yeah, yeah. right. That's where it's filmed. Yeah. All right. Okay. Number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Mm, I'm a big lawyerist fan. I think, uh, I think those boys are doing, Sam Glover and Aaron Spear are doing amazing things. Uh, I love um, Bob Ambrosi. He's always like on the cusp of everything cool that's happening he gets like the front interview for everything and i love yeah. that bob is always there um there's this podcast lost my i've heard really good things about i think, <laughs> I think that's one that people should pay particular attention to it sounds like it's a really a good podcast <laughs> because of the guests yeah, yeah. yes <laughs> right. yes okay. absolutely um okay number four if you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you what would it be oh now you're killing me <laughs> you know, I don't know if it qualifies as a condiment, but I think it might be rum. <laughs> that can go with coconut. That goes with wine. <laughs> that is a great answer. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Last one. Number five. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Uh, that's the, <clears throat> Did you guys just feed that just for me? Uh, well, if you own a winery, you sit down and drink a lot of your own wine. <laughs> so my, you know, in my practice, it's a three part, it's a, it's a three part stool, right? Practice law hard, do yoga to relax and stay fit, drink wine with friends and family for, for, for food and entertainment. That's my three pieces of success in a happy life. So I guess it's drink wine. And and, we, and and most importantly, if you really want to relax, the wine should be from Sunken Cellars. Oh, amen. Bless you for that. Yes. Sunken <laughs> All right. We made it to the end. Thanks. Thank Very you, guys. Such a pleasure. Uh, love your energy. Love the show. Thank you very much for including me as part of it. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week. Stay Lawson. Awesome.